Spring is one of my favorite times for nature photography, and trees during the spring are one of my favorite subjects. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. In this little mini class, I'll offer some of the things that I think are most important for photographing trees in the spring. I'll also talk a little bit about why I feel like this is such a special time of year. Just the feeling of the landscape transforming and the sense of renewal that we get in the spring provides all sorts of unique photographic opportunities. And in a lot of ways, it feels like a second autumn. In some parts of the United States, for example, spring trees can almost look as colorful as autumn colors. And if you don't live in an area where the trees are quite that colorful, you also have the benefit of just those beautiful fresh greens. So as leaves start to emerge and trees start to bud, you can get some really unique photographic opportunities that you don't necessarily have when the trees are more full of leaves. So I'll talk about some of those things as we get into the details. Overall, I'm gonna to focus today mostly on intimate landscapes and small scenes. So that means the, the more narrow views of a forest. So we're not trying to encompass the ent an entire scene with a wide angle lens, but instead we're trying to isolate the details that we think are most important and that resonate most with us. So those little connections that you make while out in the landscape and then isolating some of the chaos, uh, keeping that out of your frame and then focusing on those details that you find most interesting. I'm going to cover five main topics. So first, the second autumn idea and what I mean by that. Next, we'll talk a little bit about seeing opportunities. So how to tune in to the specific opportunities that exist only in spring and how you can take advantage of them from a photographic perspective. We'll also talk a little bit about working with light and being open-minded because there are opportunities throughout the day if you're open-minded about light and you know what opportunities to potentially look for. I'll also talk through some essential tools, specifically the lenses that I find most helpful for this type of nature photography. Again, focusing specifically more on intimate landscapes and smaller scenes. And then I'll talk about where to stand. It can sometimes feel intimidating to start photographing in forests because if we're completely enveloped by trees, it can feel so chaotic and like things are too close and too confining that it can be hard to know where to start. So I'll talk about a few tips about where to stand so that you can maximize your ability to find some interesting compositions and minimize some of the chaos that can sometimes make photographing trees complicated. So let's jump in. Our first topic is going to be spring colors, which I see as being like a second autumn. And this photo from the Great Smoky Mountains National Park really shows why I feel this way. So in some parts of the world during the spring, we can get incredibly colorful trees before the green leaves come out. So in this example, we see budding trees and blooming trees, and then trees that are also leafing out. And with the range of conditions, we get a full range of colors from yellows and oranges and pinks, and I feel like these colors are almost equally beautiful to the colors of autumn. In other parts of the country or the world, we don't necessarily get those same beautiful colors, but I think that the fresh greens of spring are just equally beautiful. So here in Southwest Colorado, where I live, we have mostly oaks and aspens. And when oaks and aspens leaf out, they're usually yellow to a very vibrant green. And I think those are just as equally beautiful. So it's not as colorful as the autumn, but it still provides a lot of photographic opportunities. And then even with coniferous trees, so trees that don't lose their leaves on an annual basis, we can get beautiful fresh growth. So in this case, this is another photo from the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Here we see fresh green, these like really fresh uh, tips on this coniferous tree, which I think is a hemlock, but I'm not perfectly great on IDing trees from, from that part of the country. So if I'm wrong, I apologize. But regardless, the point still stands that those fresh green tips provide an interesting contrast and they also present one of the facets of spring, which is that sense of renewal and growth. I think of spring as being a full continuum of time and it starts with the end of winter. So here in this example with aspen trees, the end of winter means that buds are just starting to show. And then you can see in the background that some of the aspens in the background are actually starting to leaf out. So we get a little bit of color from both the buds. And then we also get some color from those very first trees behind the tree that I was photographing. 
The second phase that I really enjoy is the first signs of spring. And that's when the very first leaves or, or blossoms start coming out but we still can see the beautiful structure of the tree. So we don't have leaves that are totally enveloping the trunks and the branches and just getting the first delicate, super colorful leaves coming out of, of or budding from, the tr from whatever trees you're photographing. And then the final part of this type of continuum is full spring, where we aren't quite at summer, so the leaves are still delicate, they're still more translucent, and you can see a little bit more of the, the trunks before the tree is fully leafed out. So this is the continuum of time that I wanna be out photographing. Uh, from the very end of winter to the very first signs of spring and then full spring into full spring, and then of course into summer and autumn as well. But for the purposes of our discussion today, these are the times of spring that I most enjoy photographing, which is all of it. So I would encourage you too, to think about the opportunities in your area or wherever you're traveling across this full continuum. And why do I like early spring so much? Well, it's the same reason that I like early or late fall a lot. And that's because you can see the structure of the tree. And when you can see structures of trees a little bit more, it can add character and aid your composition. And this photograph of an oak in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, I think helps illustrate this. So when we strip away all of the adornments, and by adornments, I think of the, the, those fresh leaves. Uh, and when we strip those away, what's left? And what's left is the structure of the tree. All of those branches and the trunk that give shape and, and a feel to the composition that if this tree was fully leafed out, you wouldn't be able to see nearly as much of that structure. And you wouldn't necessarily have the same visual guide that you have for how the tree kind of comes up and then radiates out. So in early spring, you can see so much more of that structure. And I feel like it both shows more of the character of a tree and that it also aids with your composition. So I think it's, from my perspective, important to get out early when trees are just leafing out because I think you have a lot more composition options and you're able to show trees uh, in different stages than people might be used to seeing them, which can provide a little bit of variety and uniqueness to your portfolio. Our next topic is going to be about seeing opportunities out in nature. And if you follow my work or you've seen any of my presentations in the past, you know that I talk a lot about mindset. And I see mindset as being how you show up. So if you think there are going to be a lot of opportunities, I think you'll see more opportunities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I approach a spring landscape in terms of seeing opportunities. Here, we can see both of these lines, the vertical and the horizontal lines, as continuums. And whenever I'm out in nature, I'm thinking about opportunities across both of these continuums. So from intimate landscapes, which is encompassing a slice of a landscape, but generally a fairly wide slice of a landscape, all the way to the smallest details. So as I'm walking through a natural setting, I'm looking around me and thinking about possible composition opportunities from that 24 millimeter focal length all the way to 700 millimeters. And I'll talk a little bit about those tools that I use later. And then I'm also thinking about the continuum from abstract to literal. And in this case, abstract, I'm meaning that I'm stripping away a lot of the context and leaving a little bit more of a mystery for the viewer to literal, where I'm thinking more about a literal presentation of a subject where it's a more obvious, like the viewer knows what they're looking at. And here I'll give a couple of examples. So in this, the top examples, these are from the cypress swamps in Texas, and the subject is the same. So it's cypress trees and some other mixed deciduous trees that provide those pops of green that you see. In the example on the left, the composition is more about some of the abstract elements. So the lines, the vertical lines that you see in the trees, the little pops of color that you see throughout the composition, and then the light that also adds another dimension of texture. So yes, you can tell what the subject is, it's trees, but the composition is based more around some of those abstract ideas. 
The example on the right, in contrast, is also what I would consider an, an intimate landscape, but I've stripped out some of those abstract qualities and my composition relies more on some of the literal qualities of the scene. So for example, by including the pond or the lake shore below, that's an obvious visual clue that adds a much more literal interpretation to the scene, where it's not so much about the patterns and shapes and textures, but it's really about, look at these trees that are interestingly growing right out of the edge of this lake. So it's a more literal interpretation. So we see across from that continuum from abstract on the left to more literal on the right, the both of these photos fall somewhere along there. So not totally abstract or totally literal, but the example on the left is a little bit more abstract and the example on the right is a little bit more literal. And when we use the aspen trees below, we can go through the same exercise, but I would consider these to be a little bit smaller scenes. So we're not getting to the point of needing a macro lens to isolate a detail that's two inches by three inches, but instead we're talking about a much smaller slice of a landscape. So just a couple of trees or one particular branch. So we have the same continuum as before, where we have abstract on the left and more literal on the right. And in this case, the example on the left is far more abstract because I have all of those leaves in the foreground completely out of focus. So they provide a kind of a soft, glowy element that obscures the details from the rest of the scene. So you can still tell that they're trees and you know that you're looking at a forest, but some of that soft, glowy look and some of the, the little pops of color add some elements that are a little bit more abstract. Whereas our example on the right it's a single branch. So from intimate landscape to small detail, this is clearly more of a small detail. It's just one branch flowing down from upper left to lower right. Those fresh green leaves, are, or in this case, they look almost yellow. This could be confused for a fall photo almost because of the color of those leaves. But here, it's a much more literal interpretation. So you can tell exactly what you're looking at, which is you're looking at the, a specific branch of a tree. You might not know what kind of tree it is, it is an aspen, uh, but you get a sense that this is a tree. So with these four examples, you can see how if I were out exploring these landscapes, I'm gonna be considering those options from the intimate landscapes where I'm encompassing a lot of the scene to those smaller details, and I'll talk through some even smaller details next, all the way from a pretty abstract rendition where you have a sense of what you're looking at, but there's still some mystery to more literal interpretations. And I think about both of these continuums as helpful to think about as I'm wandering around. What are those bigger scenes that catch my eye and what are some of the smaller scenes and what are photographic opportunities on both continuums? If we continue further along the continuum related to small details, we get to scenes like these. Details like you see here, including mosses, bark, and dewy leaves, can help add diversity to a spring portfolio. In addition to looking for compositions focused on groupings of trees and individual trees that are full of character, I also look for details like these that I think help tell the full story of life in a forest or a woodland setting. I also look for interactions between trees and the landscapes, like the vibrant green foliage reflecting in a small cascade that you see in the example in the lower right. Just like the bigger scenes that I've been talking about, I look for opportunities across the spectrum from abstractions to more literal interpretations, and you see a mix of that here. The next topic I'm going to talk about is working with light. And this continues the mindset discussion that I started earlier. I truly believe that you can find opportunities to photograph at any time of the day, you just need to be open to seeing them. And a lot of the culture of nature photography suggests that there are two times to photograph. You photograph at the golden hour, in the morning or the evening. When it comes to spring trees, there are opportunities throughout the day, and I'm going to show you some examples of my own photographs that I've taken throughout the day. The first, that traditional edges of the day. And here we have soft and gentle light. So this is when the sun is either below the horizon in the morning to just that very first light to right above the horizon in the evening to below the horizon. So we get the really soft and gentle light at the edges of the day. Sometimes it can be colorful based on what's happening in the sky. 
but generally we get the cooler light before sunrise and after sunset, and then we get warmer light after sunrise and before sunset. So the two examples on the left, the, both of those are from Utah, we see the cooler light. So the in the first case, we had a before sunrise situation, and the second example in the middle, that was an after sunset. And here we get cool light that really emphasizes the, the blues and the pinks in the photos. Like the glow that you see in the wall in the middle, that sandstone wall, that glow came because it's an after sunset glow. So that provides a nice color contrast with the green trees. And then the example on the right, that particular set of trees was photographed the, at the very last light right before sunset. So we get the warmer light on the left edges of the trees. The moss catches some of that light, but it's really soft and gentle. So generally, the edges of the day when you're photographing trees are going to provide that soft and gentle light. For midday light, this is often bold and sometimes really challenging light to photograph, but it can also provide opportunities that you can't get at other times of the day. And I think it's particularly useful for photographing spring trees because trees in the spring, as their leaves are emerging, they're much more translucent than they're going to be at other times of the year. So when you have your light source behind those leaves, they can look like they're glowing or you can work with silhouettes in an interesting way. So photographing in the middle of the day, I think is a really good opportunity to stretch your ability to work with light, sometimes challenging light, because of that feature of spring trees. We wanna take advantage of that translucence that backlighting and other midday lighting situations can provide. So in all three of these examples, I'm photographing with the light source behind the subject in some way. In the example on the left, the light is behind the light is up above the trees coming in towards me, which makes them look like they're glowing, but it's mixed. So it's, there's the clouds were moving overhead, so we have a little bit of shadow, like the background is in the shade, and then a little bit of the trees are in shade, and then a little bit of the trees are in light. So I get some mixed lighting, but I'm still emphasizing the translucence of those trees. The next example is more of a silhouette where I'm looking up into a branch of aspens overhead. And here you can see how those really translucent green leaves just let the light straight through and they look like they're, they're almost see-through in terms of how they're white. So if you were photographing the same branch a month or two later when you have the, the tree fully leafed out, you wouldn't see nearly as much of the branches and those leaves would not be nearly as translucent. So this midday light provided the opportunity to take advantage of that translucence. The next type of light that I'm looking for is dynamic light. And by dynamic light, I mean ephemeral conditions with often bold light. And bold light comes with changing weather, edges of weather, and then openings. So by all of those things, I mean light that might be transforming the way the landscape looks because light is shining through a cloud and is spotlighting a particular part of the landscape, or it's brightening mist that's just, and then the rest of the surrounding landscape is dark, or you have light coming in only on trees, but the background is in the shade because of some kind of dynamic weather. So in this particular case of light, we're talking more bold interpretations where we have brighter colors, more dynamic weather, uh, and it, it can create interesting, visually interesting photographs of trees. So on the example on the left, we have light hitting only a bit of the mist and a bit of the trees in the upper left. In the middle example, this is again moving clouds where the light is just shining through one onto one particular part of the scene. And this almost looks like it could be in fall because there's the trees and the light together, they almost look a little bit more yellow than green, but you can see that the shadows on the edges of the cliffs and then the light in the middle through that Z of fresh trees, that that type of dynamic light actually emphasizes this composition because it helps those trees in the middle glow even more than they otherwise would. And then one of my favorite types of light is quiet light. And this is soft light that falls pretty evenly over a landscape. And we get that soft light when it's overcast, foggy, misty, 
light rain and shade. So all of those opportunities and weather conditions provide that soft light over the landscape that's even, sometimes bright, sometimes dark, uh, but provides, I think, like a really gentle interpretation of a scene, which is one of my favorite things to photograph. The example of the redwoods on the left, the mist adds a little bit of depth, a little bit of mystery, softness, and evenness. So if we didn't have that evenness, this would be a much busier scene. The mist in the middle example from the Smoky Mountains, again, totally obscures most of the details of the tree. Uh, but I, I really like the feeling of misty scenes where you just get a hint of the structure of the tree and a hint of that color. And otherwise, it's just a really soft, gentle interpretation of what was a really quiet, calm, beautiful morning. And then the example on the right is from my neck of the woods in southwestern Colorado, where we have a mix of sage and oaks and aspens at different stages of leafing out. The oaks are so colorful. Uh, when people come to, to Colorado to photograph fall colors, they always think of the aspens generally, but the oaks can actually be just as colorful. And they're the same way in the spring, where they can range from having beautiful kind of bluish purpley bark. And then once they start leafing out, the, the leaves can go from orange to yellow to green. And then when you put all of those things together with the aspens, with some of which are more green, some of which are just starting to leaf out, you get this full medley of colors. And then you add in a shady situation on an overcast day, and you get soft light that allows all of those colors to shine through. When I'm out photographing trees in the spring, I typically turn to one of four tools, usually focusing on two of those four tools, but I'm gonna talk about all of them. So first is this Canon 100 to 500 lens. So it has a, a really nice versatile focal range. And this lens is typically thought of as a wildlife lens or a bird photography lens, but it's one of my absolute favorite tools for landscape photography. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the reasons why when I go through some of the examples. The second lens that I use most often is the 24 to 105. And this has a, a nice versatile focal range as well. So we're able to get some wider scenes on the 24 millimeter side of the lens. And then we're also to, able to get more isolation with the 100 millimeter end. And then I have two other tools that I sometimes use with photographing trees in the spring. Uh, the first is the 70 to 200 F4, which again is another one of Canon's lenses for their RF mirrorless line of cameras. And this lens I choose when I'm hiking and I don't want to carry this heavier lens in my pack. So I generally much prefer the 100 to 500 because of its versatility, but sometimes if I'm hiking a long ways or have a lot of other gear, I'm gonna choose the 70 to 200 just because it's more reasonable in terms of, of pack weight. And then finally, this 1.4 extender, which unfortunately doesn't work on the 70 to 200, but it does work on the 100 to 500. So this tool, I'm able to then take my 100 to 500 lens and turn it into a 100 or a uh, 150 to 700 millimeter lens. So that creates a real tool for isolation. When you're working at some of those really long focal lengths, you can sometimes get atmospheric distortion. So you have to be careful when working at the longer focal length, uh, especially with the teleconverter, if you're working with landscapes that are really far away. But generally, these, these tools create a perfect toolkit for my type of nature photography. I could add in a 14 to 35 millimeter wide angle lens under certain circumstances, and then I also use a macro lens for some of the smaller details that we'll talk about. But generally, these tools can cover pretty much everything I need. And a benefit of this 100 to 500 is it, it focuses quite close, so I can actually use it sort of like a macro lens as well. And I'll provide an example of that as we get into some of the details. So with those favorite lenses in mind, I wanted to show you some of the opportunities that you have with that focal range. So at 28 millimeters, this photograph of Mount Rainier National Park shows you with some a composition with some things close to you and then some things in the background and you get a lot of depth. So this isn't spring, but it's summer. It's like very early summer and you can see the fresh green tips 
on those coniferous trees and then the early wildflowers. So it's the same concept, a little bit different time of year, but uh, I thought that this was still a helpful example to include because it shows that wider view that you can get with a 28 millimeter lens. We zoom in just a tiny bit for the redwoods example. So we're still encompassing a big scene. So I would consider both of these two first examples to be grand intimate landscapes where you're still isolating, you're choosing a part of the landscape that really connects with you and you're isolating it. Uh, you're excluding a lot of context outside uh, of the frame, but you're still including quite a bit of landscape. So these are the bigger intimate landscapes. And then as we start getting into longer focal lengths, then we're moving into much more isolated scenes where we're excluding a lot of context and just focusing on a few things that resonate most with you. So the composition is just as much about inclusion as it is about exclusion. So with these longer focal lengths, you're seeing that I'm choosing parts of a landscape that resonate most with me, and then I'm excluding a lot of context. And this is why I feel like it's particularly valuable to have focal lengths from your 24 to 105 type lens all the way up to a 500 millimeter and sometimes with a teleconverter because then you have opportunities for photography from those grander intimate landscapes all the way to zooming in to just one set of trees on a hillside that you find particularly captivating. And then you can also use both of those tools for some of the smaller details that add diversity and complement the, the photographs of trees with some of the other details that help add to a portfolio. I also mentioned earlier how some telephoto lenses can be used sort of like a macro lens, depending on how close they can get to, the, to your subject. So all of the photos that you see here were actually photographed with my 100 to 500 lens, except for the photo in the upper right. So it's a very versatile tool for photographing some of those smaller scenes that you see in nature. Uh, like the photo with the dewdrops, for example, that's a very small section of leaves and I can still get pretty close to the leaves and then get the nice blurry background, even with a lens like a 100 to 500. So if you have a tool like that in your own bag, I would encourage you to consider using it for some of the smaller details as well. The final topic that I'm going to talk about is knowing where to stand. And I think it's particularly important with all types of photography, but with photographing trees and forests where you're in a really chaotic scene, one of the things that you're going to be focusing on a lot is how do you bring order to that chaos? And this quote from Ansel Adams, I think is a good place to start. So a good photograph is knowing where to stand. And obviously it's more complicated than that, but compos for composition, this is at least a good place to start thinking about how to photograph a, a forest or trees during the springtime. And with these examples, I wanted to communicate what I think is the most important lesson in terms of knowing where to stand. And that's going to be the edges of a landscape. And that can be things like along a river or a lake, where uh, in the case of the example on the upper left, I was sitting in a kayak near the base of these trees. So, uh, but I'm, I was able to remove myself enough, I wasn't immersed in them to be able to get a little bit of distance to frame up a composition that didn't feel quite as chaotic. Also places like along a trail or a roadside or an elevated view where you're getting up and away from the landscape so that you can then decide what's resonating most with you, zoom in and exclude a lot of those other details. So anytime you can remove yourself a little bit from the landscape, you'll potentially have more composition options because you'll be able to simplify some of that chaos. Uh, from above, so this example is uh, some fresh growth on those coniferous trees taken with a drone. And then I'm always looking for small clearings. So little hollows where there's a little bit of a, a valley or a depression or a meadow or a clearing and then trees. So roadsides and trails are great opportunities for this as well. But those small clearings, again, allow you to remove yourself a little bit from the landscape and then organize the chaos in a way that you might not be able to if you were completely enveloped. That's not to say that there aren't opportunities. Uh, like my husband, who's also a nature photographer, he's great at walking through a forest with his 14 to 35 millimeter lens and finding all sorts of wide angle scenes. 
I don't see the world in that way. So from my perspective, it's easier to be standing at an overlook or standing at a clearing, getting myself out of a forest, and then thinking about what in front of me resonates most, and then using potentially a longer lens to isolate some of those details uh, to help organize the chaos that's in front of me. I hope you found this video helpful in terms of thinking about potentially some new ways to photograph trees and forests, woodland settings, and some of the beautiful small details within them. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments and I'll see if I can answer them. And if not, I'll try to point you in the right direction. I really appreciate your time and I hope that you take some of this information, feel inspired, and go out and photograph some trees in your area.